We praise the Lord again for those who have led us in worship through song this morning and those who have ministered to us in ways that we don't know about, um, that were done before we arrived uh, here this morning. And we praise the Lord, as always, for the uh, sound ministry, for the projection ministry. It's just all such a blessing. Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. Today's sermon will be the third out of four uh, sermons in a, a mini-series on the topic of demonic or spirit possession. And we have noted up to this point that this kind of possession is mentioned very often in Scripture. Let me say this before I forget to. So if you... If you need to exit this morning to the restroom or, or whatever, whatever it is that you people do when you leave and go over there, um, keep in mind that when you go through that door to the fellowship hall, you're stepping into the nursery. And so just be ready to not let anyone escape if, you know, if someone's crawling or whatever. Um, so there you go. Uh, this kind of possession is just, here I am thinking about demon possession and I think about our toddlers. That's all, that's, all I, that's coincidence. It's mentioned often in scripture, this kind of possession. It's mentioned often. So if we don't talk about it, I never would have, I never would have planned a mini-series on this. Um, never. But, but if we... In the course of working through Acts, we come to this text, as you all know, who have been here the last few weeks, where um, demon possession is is on stage here, as it were. And if we ignore this, we're ignoring a huge chunk of Scripture because it's mentioned very, very often, especially in the New Testament, mentioned, not explained, but certainly proclaimed and described. So in the last couple of weeks, we have considered what I call the problem of possession and the pervasive nature of it, meaning in a very important sense, I've made the case the last couple of weeks from Scripture that everyone who's not a Christian, everyone who is uh, not possessed by the Spirit which is holy, is in a way possessed by Satan, who is unholy. And so the last couple of weeks, I've often cited 1 John 5, 19, this this truth that the whole world, that means means every uh, person who is not a Christian, lies under the sway of the wicked one. Everyone in this world who is still of this world, that is, everyone who is not born again, everyone who has not repented and is repenting, everyone who is not following Christ Jesus, that phrase, under the sway, the Greek, the Greek there basically means in. All such people, the Bible says, are in Satan. And, and so you tell me, what, what can be a more f- profound possession than that? He possesses them in the most overwhelming sense. 2 Timothy 2.26 describes their situation. Again, they're referring to every single person who's not a Christian. It describes their situation as, as, as having been um, taken captive by the devil to do his will. Profound possession. So we've looked at this problem of possession and and then we moved on to the um, temptation to be in partnership with those who are possessed, with those who are carnal, with those who are of the world, with those who are not of the body of Christ, not born again, not following Jesus, there's a temptation, there is what I called last week a seduction to be in various ways in partnership with them. And you can find those last two sermons on our YouTube channel. So we've studied the problem of possession, the partnership with possession, We got last week, praise the Lord, to the power of Jesus Christ over possession. And so let's read our text and then we'll get back into this. Acts 16, 
beginning with verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought our masters who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation and this she did for many days but Paul greatly New King James translation annoyed and as I said last week I don't think that's the best translation the Greek word refers to not what we would call annoyance but it refers to anguish and pain and uh, trouble and grief. So Paul is greatly troubled. He's greatly grieved. So he, the text says, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Okay. So the problem, the partnership, the power. Now we're ready to think about the prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, that one stands to gain from possession, verse 19. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they did some things that we'll talk about next week. So the profit from possession. We're talking about the perceived and practical gain of various sorts. One might be tempted to pursue by entering into partnership, significant cooperation with the world, with the uh, sinful elements of our culture, with people who have been taken captive to do the will of the devil. Please let's all understand when we enter into significant partnerships of any sort with anybody who's not born again unto following Jesus, we are partnering with, we are cooperating with a person who has been taken captive to do the will of the devil. This is really serious if we believe the Bible. I mean, do you want to date someone who has been taken captive to do the will of the devil? Do, do you want to enter into a significant business partnership with one who has been taken captive to do the will of the devil? Do, do you want some young person in your life to be playing some sport under a coach who is captive to do the will of the devil? Well, as long as they win, right? As long as they get the W... the profit from possession. It can be gained by partnership or cooperation with those who are possessed in the way that we've been speaking this day and or that profit can be gained not only with the people of the world but also by adhering to the principles of the world. Colossians 2.8, especially the last line of that verse, teaches that the basic principles of the world are contrary to Christ. And verse 20 of Colossians 2 says we are to be what? Dead to those principles. And, okay, what would those principles be? They would be ways that you can get over in this world and, and get more advantage in this world and gain more money or more power or a better position in this world by sinning by lying or stealing or cheating in, in, in all their different forms by uh, taking sinful shortcuts and, and taking sinful advantage of people both sinners and saints profit Gain. Verse 19 says, the hope of that, the hope of profit, which of course is connected to the love of money, which 1 Timothy 6.10 connects with evil, straying from the faith, greediness, and sorrows. 
Church, do we need reminded of what Jesus teaches recorded for us in Matthew 16, 26, the truth that it's possible to gain even the whole world and lose our souls in the process. We, we put ourselves in danger of doing that when we enter into significant partnership with people of the world and or by operating according to the principles of the world. And it's tempting. We, we can all sit around and act all holy if we want to, but we'd be lying. It's, it's, it's tempting because the profits, the gain, the temporal advantages can be substantial. That's letter A. It's substantial. If you'll look at verse 16, you'll see the men who have taken this possessed girl as a slave. They've taken sinful advantage of her, are gaining, according to verse 16, not just profit or gain, but I think every one of your translations uses the word much. Substantial. It's much profit. It's much gain. The, the potential is substantial if we're willing to join the people of the world and or adhere to the principles of the world which of course is also joining with the prince of the power of the air of this world, which is an Ephesians 2.2 reference to Satan himself and the spirit of Satan. And so yes, the potential temporal profit and gain is substantial, but I want you to see what God is going to do. Come with me please to the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah chapter 5. The book of Zechariah, chapter 5. You have a table of contents. No shame in using it. Right? You probably weren't in Zechariah this week. Some of you were. Zechariah, chapter 5. If you've been joining with us for Wednesday night Bible study for many years, you may remember what we're about to see because we worked through Zechariah. We worked through all the writing prophets, major and minor, over a hmm, about a nine-year span or so on Wednesday nights. I don't remember when we were in Zechariah, but I remember we were we got through it. Zechariah chapter five, beginning with verse five. Here's what I said to get us here. I said, I know the temptation is there because the gain, the profit, the potential thereof is substantial. But we need to be reminded of what God is going to do. Zechariah 5.5, 5, Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, Lift your eyes now and see what this is that goes forth. So I asked, what is it? And he said, it's a basket that's going forth. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted up, and this is a woman sitting inside the basket. Then he said, this is wickedness, and he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. Keep your Bible open to this passage, please. So Zechariah sees this, this basket in verse 6, but it's important that we understand what this basket is. In the original Hebrew, it's not just any kind of basket. It's a very, very specific kind of basket. It's a basket used to measure grain. This kind of basket was very, very common in that culture and was normally associated with economics. And so it wasn't just to measure grain. Really, it was to measure gain. You'd often see people on their way to the marketplace carrying these particular baskets. Wealth was measured in that culture by how many of these kind of baskets of grain a person owns. So you can almost associate this kind of basket with a wallet or a purse or a bank account. So keep that in mind. For, for a little bit later. This basket is not just a basket, but a basket associated with money, with profit, with gain. Now, verse 7, please. What's inside the basket? You tell me. 
A woman is inside the basket. Now, we don't have to guess what this woman symbolizes. Verse 8 tells us she symbolizes what? Nice and loud. Wickedness. And, and most of your translations probably use a capital W. So, so not just a specific example of wickedness, but, but the entire concept of wickedness. Now, in verse 7, we have this lead disc. The Hebrew word here can be used a couple of different ways. It actually refers to dust. So sometimes it gets translated lead, my Hebrew dictionary says. Because, and the reason I always slide that in, my Hebrew dictionary says, is to remind you again that I didn't take Hebrew. I don't know this stuff. It's just these resources are, are here for us. And so my Hebrew dictionary tells me that it was sometimes called lead because the color resembled dust. But the word also means to pulverize, as in pulverize something to dust. And in this vision, the pulverizer is, in verse 8, thrown down over this woman who is thrust down in the basket. So what's God telling his people? He's telling them there's coming a day where I will not only pulverize every sinner not hidden in the sinless one of Christ, but I also will pulverize the very concept of sin. Notice in verse 6, please, the basket is doing what? Going forth. The concept of wickedness, the concept of sin connected, don't forget, to profit and gain is going, it's, it's being totally removed from the presence of God's people. Think about this if you know a little bit about the book of Zechariah. He and the rest of the remnant of Jews have returned to the land of promise after having been exiled to Babylon. Why were God's people in exile? Because of sin is the short answer. So what had been demonstrated for hundreds of years is the truth that although God got his people out of Egypt, he hasn't yet gotten Egypt out of his people. My dad came out of Kentucky. I promise you Kentucky never came out of my dad. Not for a moment. God has shown His people the grace of remove, listen, of removing them from their sinful context. But the truth was, and the truth is, that we can talk all we want about the sinfulness of our culture, but that doesn't change the truth that the sinfulness is right inside of us. The Bible says we're all like, we're like a, an unclean thing. We're all like that kid who gets in trouble over and over and over. And his parents keep saying, well, it's because he's hanging out with the wrong people. It's like my, my, my kid is great. He just gets mixed up with the wrong people. And, and at some point it has to occur to us that my kid is the wrong people. The trouble is not just around us. Trouble's inside of us. We're not sinful because we sin. We sin, why? Because we're sinful. But that won't always be the case. The vision says that one day God will slam the lid down on sin and send it forth. And it will be removed from the presence of his people. Meanwhile, dear church, we better listen we better not be in the basket with the woman. We better not be in significant partnership and fellowship and cooperation with what's in the basket because if we are, the lid will eventually be slammed down on our heads too. Verse 9 then I raised my eyes and looked, and there was two women coming with the wind in their wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Oh, zoom in on that. They lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. We'll come back to that. Verse 10, so I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me, to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. When it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. Now, this is just amazing. Amazing. 
These two women come. And in the context of this particular vision, women are symbolizing what? Wickedness, all right? Just in the con doesn't mean that women are wicked. It, it, in the context of this particular vision, women are symbolizing wickedness. And these two women come, and they are coming rather swiftly. With what's it say? With the wind in the wings. Their wings are like that of what animal in the New King James at least? The stork. According to Leviticus 11, storks are ritually unclean. That text even refers to them as an abomination. And these two women making us think of wickedness and uncleanness and something which is an abomination to God. The end of verse 9 there says, they lift up the basket between earth and heaven. Okay, what's in the basket? Wickedness. What lifts it up between earth and heaven? Wickedness. What else in the Bible is lifted up between earth and heaven? I would suggest to you it's the cross of Christ. Because of his holiness, Jesus was rejected upon the earth. And because of my sin, which was imputed to him, he was also rejected by heaven, Psalm 22. No place was found for Jesus on earth. No place was found for Jesus in heaven. So he was lifted up on a cross between earth and heaven. Now, according to the flesh, who lifted him up on this cross? Matthew 26, 45 and Mark 14, 41 says it was the hands of sinners who did that. It was the hands then of wickedness, the hands of evil, the hands of sin, the hands of abomination. What had Jesus become when he was lifted up like this on the cross? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he had become sin. He had become evil. He had become wickedness. He had become an abomination. And so we have a very accurate depiction here in Zechariah 5 of the sin of all of God's people being concentrated all in one place. In the vision, a basket. In reality, the cross. And then under the sovereign hand of God, the sin is removed from God's people by sinful hands of humans. Who would believe such a thing was possible? Who could imagine such a thing? Now hang with me, verse 10. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. And when it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. Shinar is another word for Babylon. It's, it's where the Tower of Babel was built specifically. In Scripture, we've covered this many times, Babylon always represents the world. Babylon always represents that which is under the sway of the devil. So listen, sin finds its house. Sin finds its home. Sin finds its base where? In Babylon, meaning to us in the world. Sin finds its home in the world. It's its home base in the world. Back in Zechariah 2, 7, God had pleaded with his people saying, Up, Zion! When you see Zion in the Old Testament, think about the church in the New Testament. Up, church! Escape, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. Old Testament. New Testament, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't even touch what's unclean and I'll receive you. Wickedness finds its house, finds its home, finds its base in Babylon, in the world, with its people and with its principles. So we're using the word world here like it's often used in the New Testament. That is the organized satanic system which opposes God. And God tells his elect to come out of that system because he's going to destroy that system. So, beloved church, be not in partnership with those who are profiting from that system. 
Yes, we have to operate in the world. We get that. This does not mean we're going to go. I was, I was joking with uh, uh, Pastor Aaron Lentz the other day because there, there's like a housing addition. Where is it? Right off of uh, Tally Road there called Athens uh, something. There's like condos or something. And I said, oh, is, is Athens Church, are they going, are they going full on commune now? Because the symbol they used was very similar. This, we have to operate in the world, but we must not operate according to the principles of the world. Does that make sense? We'll close in the book of Revelation. Would you turn there with me to chapter 17, please? We'll close there. Revelation 17. So I noted in an email to you all that by canceling Sunday school and meeting at 11, we gained 10 degrees of warmth for our re-entry into the elements. And at noon, we were supposed to gain, according to Fox 59 weather app, we were supposed to gain three more degrees. But I figure if I preach past noon, it'll be balmy (laughs) by the time we get out there. Revelation 17. I'm going to read quickly, verse 1. Almost without comment here, just want you to see what God's going to do with this world, with this economic system. We must not be insignificant. I know we have to operate within it, but we must not be in significant partnership with it to profit from it by adhering to its principles. That's what we're after. Revelation 17, 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk by the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Behold God's description of this system, this worldly system. Verse 5, on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. If the Lord gives us next week, we'll talk a bit about this woman named Babylon and her involvement with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs. We'll get to that next week. But as we've studied the problem and the uh, pervasiveness of possession and the temptation of significant partnership with possession because of potential profit from possession, as we've studied the power over possession, next week we'll look at the persecuting that goes on by those who are possessed, the persecuting which results in the shed blood of the saints of God and the martyrs of Jesus. Before we leave, would you look with me one more passage? I promise it'll be the last one. Revelation 18. Revelation 18, verse 1. All of this is just to say, don't be cozy in the basket. Revelation 18, 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. You ask, what in this world, what, what in the world, what's this world coming to? Verse 2 there is part of the answer. That's what it's coming to. And why is it coming to that? Verse 3, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth, brothers and sisters, don't don't, uh, um, be thinking of, of a guy wearing a crown. This is all of those who are powerful by way of economics, by way of politics, uh, by way of uh, technology. Don't be distracted by the word kings. That group includes a wide array of people in power. And they, 
the text continues, have committed fornication with her, that is, with Babylon, with the world, by entering into partnership with the people of the world and or adhering to the principles of the world. And the merchants, verse 3 continues, of the earth, have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. How many times? This is like the fourth time in the Bible that we see these words. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Church, those who profit by partnership with the world and adhering to the principles of the world will suffer the plagues of the world because it will ultimately be revealed that they were people of the world themselves all along. I don't care how many church services they endured. Verse 5, for her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I said as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. That's what those of this world think, brethren. Those who are powerful in this world and rich because of, of adhering to the principles of this world think they're untouchable. Verse 8, her plagues will come in one day. That means suddenly. Death and mourning and famine shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and live luxurious with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a distance for fear of her torment saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city for in one hour your judgment has come and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. Why? For no one buys their merchandise anymore more and then verse 12 mentions a bunch of stuff the world has deemed as more precious than God more precious than Christ stuff for which they have entered into partnership with demons and stuff for which they have adhered to the principles of the same stuff in which they have thusly trafficked including the end of verse 13 says the bodies and souls of men meaning mankind such as the possessed girl has been trafficked in our text in Acts 16. Now verse 14, please. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her by adhering to the principles of the world will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by ship sailors and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning saying what is like this great city they threw dust on their heads and cried out weeping and wailing and saying alas alas that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth for in one hour she is made desolate now listen to the instruction to people of God verse 20 rejoice Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down. Thus with violence God shall throw down this world and shall not be found anymore. Think of that lead disc being thrust down on the head of wickedness. Verse 22, we're in the home stretch. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain on the earth. And we'll talk about that persecution of the church in our final installment of this series next week. But we close now with a reminder. 
that although joining forces with the world, entering into significant partnerships with those of the world, hitching your wagon to stars of the world, people of this world who have been taken captive to do the will of the devil, conducting ourselves according to the principles of this world, deeming acceptable what Babylon says is acceptable, the profit from doing all of that is tempting because it's temporarily tantalizing to say otherwise for most of us will be lying. But no temptation, brothers and sisters, has overtaken you except such as common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of what? Escape. And he calls to us from the door of that escape, the way of that escape, which is Jesus Christ. Come out from among them and be separate. The hymn says, nothing in my hand I bring, only to the cross of Christ I claim.